Now we have uh, Ethan Butte. <laughs> Ethan's got his own fan club as well. He is the VP of Content and Communications at BombBomb. Bomb. He has a background in and passion for brand strategy, content, and communications. For 14 years, he directed the marketing efforts for local broadcast television stations and websites in Chicago, Grand Rapids, and Colorado Springs. With BombBomb, Bomb, he helps people use simple videos to communicate more effectively, to build relationships, and to grow their businesses. He's a BA from the University of Michigan, MBA from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. He's a happy husband and father. Please welcome Ethan Butte. So this is an absolute privilege to share this room and this evening with all of you. Thank you all for being here. It's awesome to share the stage with so many other great folks as well. Uh, I'm going to start with a few questions, and I really need you just to shout out your answer when you have it. I need to be able to hear you, and don't worry, your neighbor's not going to judge you about it. First question, it's about connection and communication, in terms of connecting and communicating with other people. Are you better in a typed out text email, or are you better on the phone? Phone, immediately. We all know we're better on the phone. We have a lot more give and take, a better feedback loop. We've got our voice, tone, pace, personality. Just a lot more information to work with. It's a better piece of communication. Now, similar question, different choices. Are you better on the phone or are you better in person? Person! In person. We're all better in person because that feedback loop is now taken up another level. We have all the vocal elements, but we also have face, posture, body language, all this rich nonverbal communication that our brains are wired to receive from one another. We're fellow human beings, we're social creatures, we're better in person, and we know it right away, because you answered immediately. Now, here's the problem. Maybe not. I just uh, bias the audience. Think about your own personal and professional success and your own life satisfaction, right? Flourishing, your own personal, human flourishing, personally and professionally. Are you getting together with people as often as you need or want to in person? No. no, absolutely not. Not even close. So few of us are, and there are a lot of reasons, a lot of excuses. I think it comes down to two main things, time and distance. Time and distance conspire to keep us apart. But we need to get together in person because that's how we connect and communicate most effectively, build relationships, and flourish as individuals. So that's what we're going to be talking about here why we need to get face-to-face, -face, and how to overcome time and distance as things that keep us apart. Now, some of what I'm going to share with you tonight is informed and inspired by a really great opinion piece I read in the New York Times last February. And in it, the, the writer, Stephen March, uh, talked about just some gross abuses of other human beings that occur as a consequence of not having to face them, of not having to look them in the eye hiding behind that cloak of digital anonymity. I'm talking about cyberbullying, internet trolling, flame wars and comments, threads, and all of that, saying things and doing things that you would never say if I had to look you in the eye. I would never say that to you in person, but if I can hide that way, I might do those things. Now, I'm going to take it in a different direction than that, but I am going to start with my favorite line from his piece, which is this. As communication and exchange come at a remove, the flight back to the face takes on a new urgency as communication and exchange come at a remove. Think about all those messages you're sending all day long. Every time you click send, these are some of your most important messages, your most valuable messages. In a lot of cases, you have a lot riding on the outcomes of these messages being effective. And yet, you continue to entrust those to forms of communication short on personality and short on clarity. I'm talking about all your typed out emails, your text messages, even so much of our social media is all faceless digital communication. It's the same black text on the same white screen with a little emoticon punched in sometimes. Why do we do that? To make it more clear what we meant. Is he serious or is he joking, right? We need to add some clarity. We do it sometimes to add a little personality or a little bit of fun. Frankly, we use it as a substitute for the absent human face. And of course, it has not always been this way. Human beings have been speaking to one another. We've had spoken communication as a species with one another for 150,000 years. I've seen estimates that are much higher, but I'm a conservative decision maker, so I'm going to go with 150,000 years. And of course, if you think about it, almost that entire time it's been exclusively face-to-face. -face. It's only been in the past few generations that we've been able to transmit our voices and transmit our faces through technology, and certainly only in the last couple of decades 
that we've been able to rely on some of the space, faceless digital communication. Meanwhile, so that's 150,000 years. Meanwhile, how long have we been writing? 5,000 years. 1 30th of the amount of time. If this is all the time we've been speaking to one another, almost exclusively face to face, this is how long we've been writing. So it's 3% of the time. It's not as natural to us. It's not as fundamentally human. And frankly, most of us aren't very good at it. Right? We're not. It's a difficult skill to master. It takes a lot of time and effort and energy. And some of you in the room are probably very good writers, but most of us, on average, are not. And so what we're left with is messages that leave us sometimes misled and misunderstood. And we can do better than that. Speaking of misunderstanding, have you ever heard or read 93% of your communication is nonverbal? Or in terms of the words that you use, they only add 7% of the meaning to your communication? Some of you have. So that's a, a, a common uh, misinterpretation of the work of UCLA psychologist Albert Moravian, who published uh, several decades ago the 738-55 rule of communication. And he wasn't trying to, uh, to do what people often try to say that his work did. He was simply trying to quantify the positive emotional affect of our words, our voices, and our faces. 738-55, that's where the 93 comes from. And, and even when it's taken for exactly what it's intended, there are a number of flaws with the work. Um, it, but the one positive attribute of it is that people continue to use it, uh, even if they misuse it. And the reason I don't mind it is that it keeps top of mind something really important, which is how we say something has a significant impact on how effective the communication is. How we say something with our voices and how we say something with our faces contributes a massive amount of value, whether or not it's 93 doesn't matter, it adds a massive amount of value to whether our message is understood or whether our message is liked, whether it produces the outcome that we hope for, right? And so I don't know that the 93 is really all that far off. In fact, the face has a language all of its own. Human facial expression of emotion is both universal and it's innate. It's universal. There's a really rich body of research here around uh, facial expression of emotion. We're talking, of course, about different researchers at different institutions and in different universities on different continents and different countries and different cities, different cultures, different decades these studies span. Obviously, it involves different participants, different methodologies, and despite all these differences, this body of research points very often to one conclusion, which is seven human emotions expressed the exact same way through our faces across societies, across culture, across time. We all do it the same way, and that's my son, and some of those expressions are non-standard. <laughs> so it's not just our ability to express these emotions through our faces, right? To write these emotions to our faces. It's also, of course, our ability to read them and to recognize them on other people and to understand them. And we do it automatically and instantly without ever thinking about it. It's, again, it's a language all its own. So it's universal and it's innate, it's innate to us. We can all do it from infancy and it is not learned behavior. One of the studies that I looked at had blind and sighted people and they looked at the way they were expressing emotions through their faces, and from a statistical standpoint, it's identical. So it's not a cease mimicry thing. Our faces have their own language, and it's innate to the human experience. And of course, the eyes have a, a massive amount of contribution to that facial language that we have. One place where French phenomenology and contemporary neuroscience agree, and there are not very many, is here. That awareness of the self is preceded by recognition of the other. That's to say, I know myself as a human being only after and only through the process of looking you in the eye and recognizing you first as a human being. And in that moment of sheer humanity and connection, there's kinship built, right? And of course, kinship is the spark of empathy, the moral impulse, the ethical impulse. One of my very favorite podcasts is On Being with Krista Tippett. And she had a conversation with U.S. Congressman John Lewis from Georgia, who was also a civil rights leader. And he was explaining one of the key teachings of young men and women as they were preparing to go out for nonviolent protests during the civil rights era. And this teaching was to maintain eye contact and smile no matter what. Verbal assault, physical assault, someone spits upon you, try to maintain eye contact and smile to that person. Why? 
to create that moment of human connection through the eyes. To hopefully say to that person, you may be doing whatever you're doing to me, but I am a human being, and hopefully create that moment of empathy and diffuse the situation. Naturally, if the face and the eyes are tied to uh, empathy and ethics, it's also tied to justice. That's the uh, Confrontation Clause in the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution, which uh, of course takes root 2,000 years earlier in Roman courts where no case would advance for consideration prior to the victim and the accused meeting face to face. So you knew it intuitively, you said it emphatically, I'm best in person, I'm not getting in person often enough, and we need to overcome this. We need to make that flight back to the face. We need to make this a commitment in our lives because through this, we connect and communicate most effectively, we build relationships more effectively, and relationships, I think, I know, I feel it, I think you feel it too, relationships are where all of our success comes from. Our personal and professional success and life satisfaction come through directly and indirectly our, respond, uh, our relationships with other people. And so the first way I propose that we overcome time and distance, which are the things that keep us apart, is sheer force of will. Simply get it done, right? Stop prioritizing other things over it. Take Tuesday afternoon, cancel the appointments, and go see him, or go visit her, or go out and connect with them. Just get it done. Raise it up as a priority. We can do this. We have control over our own lives. And you might have to make some sacrifices when you do that, but I promise you won't be sorry if you do. One of the very best things I ever read on the internet was written by Carrie Egan. And at the time, she was a Harvard Divinity student. She was also a student chaplain in a hospice program. And of course, as a consequence of that work, she spoke with a lot of people as they prepared to die. And she, of course, did a lot of listening to people in these moments when they're reflecting and reaching for meaning and purpose and trying to you know, put together all these things that they've experienced. And so she wrote about what we talk about as we prepare to die, and it's pretty much exactly what you would think. It's not about the money or how many widgets we sold in our career. It's about who we sold those widgets to and who we sold those widgets with. It's not about the house or the fancy car. We talk about who was along for the ride and who was waiting for us at the destination. We don't even talk about our religion or its deity, or its tenets. We talk about who we practice that religion with, and through whom the deity and its tenets became manifest. We talk about people. We talk about relationships. We talk about family. We talk about kinship. We talk about love. These are the things that matter, and you know this. As I say, you know that it's true. We all know it intuitively. And so I promise that if you make that commitment to get face to face with people, you won't regret it no matter what you have to cancel unless it's other people, don't do that, <laughs> okay? And even with your best intentions, right? You're all motivated now and you're like, oh man, I'm gonna, go out. I'm gonna get that done, right? You're still gonna come up short. You're gonna come up short because other things get in the way, or this is the positive side of that, you're gonna do it and it's gonna be so uh, intrinsically valuable to you and it's gonna reward you so much that you're gonna want even more and you're gonna uh, come up short in that way. And so in those cases, I encourage you to be there in person when you can't be there in person, through video. And when I say video, I'm not talking about scripted videos and edited videos and produced videos or any of that. I'm talking about simple face-to-face -face communication. I'm talking about relationships through video, and you already have what you need to get started. It's that webcam that's built into your laptop. Like when you buy it, it's already in there, or it's in your monitor. Or uh, you can plug it into the side of your computer by USB and it's very inexpensive and easy to do and it's sufficient quality. It's that little dot that's in your laptop that's a camera, you should use it, right? Or it's that phone you've got right now in your purse or your pocket. What does that phone have? What's one of its key features? A camera, of course. And every time you get a new phone, what does it have in it? A better camera. Why do they do that? So you use it. Right? Seeing you feel better about how you look when you're sharing photos and videos of yourself and other people that matter to you in your life. So you have the equipment that you need to get started. And just as cameras are a key point of comp competition for the smartphone manufacturers, so too are video features for the social networks. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, all rolling out video features, always upgrading the video features. Right now it's all about live video. They want you sharing live video with other people in your world, in your personal network, in your family. They want you sharing live video. And of course live video is what you've long had available. Microsoft gives you Skype. Google gives you Hangouts. Apple gives you FaceTime. These are free tools and guess what? 
It's connected to the device, it's connected to the internet that can get you face to face with anyone, anywhere, anytime. As long as you and one or more other people have a device and the internet connection, you have the free software, you can get face to face with anyone in the world anytime. And in that way, we completely eliminate distance, right? So distance is no longer an issue. But we still have time. Hey, can you Skype at 2? No, I'm not available till 4. Sorry, I can't do 4. How about next Tuesday? Right? We've all done that dance. So time continues to be an issue. And in that scenario, I encourage you to think about recording and sending simple videos. And that's what we do at BombBomb. Bomb. We're a software company in downtown Colorado Springs. We make it really easy to record and send simple video messages, typically an email, uh, just to help get you face to face with more people more often. And there's an asynchronicity there. I record it when it's convenient for me, I send it out to four people, and she opens it immediately, he opens it five minutes later, he opens it five hours later, and that guy in the back, five days. What's he doing? Is he on vacation? So it, there's an asynchronicity there, so time and distance then are not the same issue, but when each one of those people opens that message up, they experience me in person. It's like I'm there with them. I hear it all the time. I have great relationships with a lot of our customers, and one of the things that they describe very frequently to me is a phenomenon called propinquity. Now, they don't use the word propinquity when they describe it, they all use their own words, but propinquity is a psychological proximity built through frequency and familiarity of exposure. So, people feel psychologically proximate to you when you get face to face with them more often. It's a nearness, and, and it's, again, independent completely of physical proximity. I can feel connected to you. I can feel closer to you as a consequence of experiencing, experiencing you in person more often. We had a uh, research project in the field with a team from Harvard Business School last month. And as the lead researcher was preparing the study, trying to figure out what he wanted to do with video and email versus text and email, what do we want to get at, uh, it's a gentleman named Andrew Brodsky, a, a doctoral candidate there at Harvard, uh, he thought it would be really helpful in designing the study and choosing the instruments and the methodology and all that to speak with some of our customers first. And so I rounded up a couple dozen uh, names and numbers of people who said they'd be happy to talk with him. And he had some of those conversations and then we got back together and I said, Andrew, what did you learn? And he shared a number of things with me, but there were two key things that stood out. One was the propinquity piece, which didn't surprise either one of us. We expected to hear, I had kind of seeded that with him. I said, this is something I hear a lot. Something else though that he heard that I had not heard that to me was very interesting and in a way very beautiful was that it's not just the recipient that feels closer to the sender, it's also the sender feeling closer to the recipient. He said a number of people told him, I feel closer to my past clients or to my friends when I reach out to them in this more personal way. It's really interesting to me. I hadn't thought about it. I guess when I reflected on it, I may have maybe it experienced the same thing. But to have him hear it from a number of people made me think about the process of looking the camera in the lens and talking to you, trying to convey any empathy I have for your situation, offer you any value, whatever it is that I'm reaching out to you about through that communication. The process of looking in that lens, conjuring you in my mind, and speaking to you as if I'm there with you in person has a significant impact on me as well. I feel closer to the people that I'm working with, and people that I want to work with, and people that I'm family with, and people that I'm friends with. I feel closer to you as a consequence of that practice as well. And it's a really interesting thing that made me think about what we're normalizing every single day. What's normal in your communication patterns? What's appropriate? What standards are you setting? What expectations are you setting of yourself and of other people? And are they sufficiently human? Are they sufficiently full of personality and clarity? Are you being your best self? Are you producing your own flourishing through your communication? So I just want to leave you with this idea. You're going to hit send soon and often, because we do it all the time. But I want you to think the next time you're about to hit send, would it be better if I said it in person? And it probably will. Thank you. Thank you very much, you did a great job.